Hi, I'm Richard Mikulak. I've been a filmmaker for 40 years, a director of photography for 30 years, and in that time I've shot news documentaries, music videos, television commercials, and about 17 feature films. I've distilled all of that experience and knowledge down to some simple techniques and concepts that I'd like to share with you. Many of you may ask, why can't I leave the camera on automatic? Well, the answer is that to tell a complex story or an interesting story, you need to be able to understand and know how to use all of the camera's functions, because each of those functions will help give your story its unique flavour. To plan your film and to communicate your ideas to others, you should use the standard industry shot description terms. They are wide shot, mid shot and close up. A wide shot is what it sounds like. It's a wide shot of all the action. Early films were like watching a play on the stage. They were often shot in just one wide shot. But filmmakers soon realised that they could add a lot more interest by moving the camera closer. A mid shot is a shot from the waist up. A close-up is a shot of their head and shoulders or a closer shot of their face. A close-up can also refer to a close shot of a piece of action. The ability to do wide shots and close-ups means you now have to decide which shots to do. Think of the scene and decide what information you need to convey. If the actor is showing a lot of emotion, then you probably need to do a close-up. But if he has to be seen doing something, well then you probably have to do a wider shot. Try to have each of the shots convey more information than the last. This improves your storytelling and it keeps the audience interested. It's a great idea to make a storyboard before you make your film. A storyboard is a rough illustration of all the shots in your film. You make it to help you order your thoughts and you also make it to help those who are going to help you make the film understand exactly what you're trying to do. You don't need to be a good drawer to make a storyboard. You don't even need to draw at all. You can make one using still photos. You can get your friends who are not necessarily the actors and you can put them in situations that are similar to the set or the situation you're going to film in. It doesn't have to be the same situation. Um, you can photograph them doing things that are roughly the same as you're wanting to put into the storyboard and then you can take them all and put them into a program called Celtex. And Celtex is a free program you can download that has a storyboard function in it. If you're having trouble framing something satisfactorily, try putting major objects or major lines in the frame one third up, one third down, or one third across. Framing the horizon in the middle of the frame is usually not very satisfactory. If you move the horizon up to the upper third or down to the lower third, or even up to the upper quarter and down to the lower quarter, you will usually get a much stronger shot. Here we have our actor back in the same set. I've placed him on the right third of frame because I find that more comfortable. He's looking from right to left and there's a general concept called looking room. And looking room says that when a person is looking you should give them some room to look through. The opposite of that is uh, putting them in the middle of the frame. A lot of people would originally line this shot up there with the camera in the middle of the frame. Uh, it's not so comfortable because the eye doesn't like to see things in the middle of the frame. Um, and as I see when you, as you'll see when I pan back, you, it's just the whole thing is composed much more comfortably and nicely with the actor on the uh, right hand third 
and a bit of space where he's looking. Eccentric framing is unconventional framing. In conventional framing, whichever way a person is looking, you give them looking room. Here we have our actor on the right of frame. He's looking to the left, and that's why we have more space on the left of frame. He's placed about a third of the way along the frame, giving him plenty of room. Unconventional framing would be to put our actor hard up to the left side of the frame with no looking room. Conventional framing is comfortable for the viewer. Unconventional framing can be disturbing, but this is not always a bad thing. How you point your camera can tell a story differently. A high angle can make someone look weak. A low angle can make someone look dominant. An angle level with someone's face will tend to look more normal. It may seem obvious, but it's important to have the actions, the wardrobe and the props all consistent from shot to shot and scene to scene. In this example, our actor has a glass of water in his right hand in the wide shot, but in the close-up, he's picked it up with his left. This can easily jar an audience out of your story. Another example is if our actor leaves the frame in one set of clothes but appears in the next frame in a different set of clothes, it suggests that this is another day. If it's not supposed to be another day, it jars the audience. Because films are shot nearly always out of order, this can be a very easy mistake to make. Hi. Hi, can I uh, use the computer? No? Correct eye lines help to make things cut together in a smooth way. If we cut from our actor in this close-up to me in this close-up, it looks like we're not looking at each other. To work out the correct direction of someone's eye line, imagine there's a line between the two people in the wide shot. You can then put the camera anywhere on the same side of the line that the camera is on in the wide shot. But if you do a shot from the other side of the line, you will end up with shots that look like people are not looking in the right directions. To avoid confusion, the direction of someone's eye line should always be described from the camera's point of view. Here's the wide shot. Our actor should be looking right to left in the close-up because he's looking right to left in the wide shot. And I should be looking left to right in the close-up because I'm looking left to right in the wide shot. This may all seem unbelievably obvious, but it's often not when you're in the middle of making a film. Most people have used a camera with a zoom lens. When we zoom the lens out, we call that a wide lens. When we zoom the camera in, we call that a long lens. Rather than using a single zoom lens that goes all the way from wide to long, for quality reasons, most DSLR users attach a wide lens, a medium lens, or a long lens. If you are framing a shot using a wide lens, it exaggerates the distance between the foreground, the midground, and the background. Here, the whiskey bottle looks quite small. If you use a long lens to set up the same shot, it compresses the distance between the foreground, midground, and background. Consequently, the whiskey bottle looks larger and the features of the actor's face look more normal. As you see from the examples, the choice of lenses is not always obvious. You can use a wide lens to do a close-up, and you can also use a long lens to do a wide shot. It's a good idea to experiment with this. Most filmmakers get bored with static shots and eventually want to move the camera. If you move the camera in a smooth way, the audience will continue looking at the subject. But if you move the camera in an unsmooth way, 
the audience will become distracted by the camera movement and may cease noticing the subject. In many cases, a camera movement that isn't smooth may give the impression of being the point of view of another character. If you have access to a dolly, you may be able to do smooth tracking shots that don't look like someone else's point of view. If you can't get access to a dolly, there are other ways to move the camera. You can use a car, you can use a wheelchair, or you could even use a skateboard. A zoom is a two-dimensional move in on the subject, but a tracking shot actually moves the camera closer to the subject and therefore you get changes in perspective. If you're doing a handheld tracking shot into a static subject, you might find that you have a bit of trouble keeping it steady. But if you do a handheld tracking shot with a moving subject, then you'll often get better results. If you try to do a handheld walking shot with a long lens, you'll get a lot of lens shake. But if you widen the lens and get closer to your subject, you will tend to smooth out some of the bumps. One of the problems with handheld on the smaller cameras is that they often shake a bit because they're very light. The easiest way to increase the weight of the camera and do smoother shots is to shoot the shot with the tripod folded up and attached to the camera. Autofocus is a function that automatically focuses your camera. You might want to use this when you're in a hurry but most of the time you want to focus the camera exactly where you want it focused. We're going to show you how to focus a traditional video camera and then a new DSLR. We're zooming into the subject and we're focusing. And then once we've got the focus right, we zoom back and reframe exactly as we want the shot. We're framing our shot correctly. We're moving the white box over the subject. We then hit the magnification button and then focus exactly. And then hit it again to go back to the original frame. If you want to adjust the focus during a shot, this is called pulling focus. You can make beginning and end tape marks to help you pull focus. In this case, we've got one mark for the glass of water and another mark for the actor. If you want to practice pulling focus, a good way is to put your camera on its longest lens and go by the side of the road and practice focusing on cars as they go by. Film is a succession of still photos that progressively move past our eyes at a speed high enough to make it look like fluid motion. Each successive picture is called a frame. In some countries, television and video is shot at 25 frames a second and in others at 30 frames a second. To understand slow motion, you just have to think about the playback speed. As I said, in some countries the playback speed is 30 frames per second and in others it's 25. If you're in a country that does 30 frames per second and you shoot at 30 frames per second, you will get normal motion. If you shoot at 60 frames per second, it will still play back at 30 frames per second and that means what you will see is slow motion because the, the film or the video will take twice as long to play back. 
Images shot at 25 or 30 frames a second can be slowed down in the edit, but the result is never as good as if you shot at slow motion in the first place. The shutter speed is the speed at which the camera takes each individual photo. If the shutter speed is slow, anything moving will be blurred. If the shutter speed is fast, anything moving will be sharp. A certain amount of blur in images is actually a good thing. Your brain actually sees things with a certain amount of blur. If you move your hands in front of your face, you see a certain amount of blurring. Um, so when we shoot film, some blur is good and there is a way to calculate the correct shutter speed to make sure that you have the right amount of blur so action looks normal and that is to double your frame rate. If you are shooting at 30 frames a second, the correct shutter speed is 1 60th. If you are shooting at 25 frames a second, the correct shutter speed is 1 50th. And if you, for some reason, were shooting at 500 frames per second, your correct shutter speed would be 1,000. I've got this thing here and this little hole is opening and closing. It's the hole in the lens and the lens hole is called the aperture or the iris. They're the same name, two names for the one thing. We measure the size of the hole by f-stops. The lens is just like your eye. You have an iris in your eye and that opens in a dark room or closes down in bright light. Now, if we're shooting a scene in a room and we set the aperture to an f-stop of 5.6 and you change it to f8, the image gets darker because the hole is smaller and less light can get through. Alternately, if you change the f-stop to f1.8, the image gets lighter because the hole is larger and more light can get through. Lenses have differing lowest f-stops. Shooting on a lens with a lower f-stop means that you can shoot in a darker situation. This 70-200 zoom has a lowest f-stop of 2.8, whereas this 85mm lens goes down to 1.8. As well as controlling the amount of light entering the lens, the f-stop also affects the depth of field. Depth of field is how much is in focus in front and behind the point of focus. In this example, our actor is the point of focus and behind him are numbers and in front of him is the computer screen. At a low f-stop, the numbers and the computer screen are blurred, but at a high f-stop, they are more in focus. If you want to change the f-stop to change the depth of field, you'll have to remember that you're also changing the amount of light coming into the camera. So to compensate, you'll have to use another system. In this example, we've just changed the ISO to compensate and maintain the correct exposure. The sensitivity of a camera governs how well it will see in low light. You can increase the sensitivity, but you will also increase the amount of grain in the image. Sensitivity is controlled by the ISO 
or the gain controls, depending on which camera you are using. Here we have two identical pictures, only differing in the amount of ISO used. With DSLRs, ISOs below 1600 are considered good quality. If you have to use an ISO above 1600, it's probably because you're going to run out of light anyway and not get the shot. So go ahead and shoot it and hope for the best. There are many filters you can use with photography, but the three most useful ones are UV filter. This is a, basically a clear glass filter that has a little bit of treatment on it to help cut out ultraviolet light. It protects your lens. It uh, doesn't have any effect on the exposure. The next filter is a neutral density filter. It's basically grey as you can see against my skin and um, it doesn't change the colour. It just knocks down the amount of light that's there. You can still get a perfectly good exposure without using the ND filter, but using it allows you to have more control over the f-stop and the shutter speed. Here we have our actor in a park with some buildings behind. The buildings are quite in focus. The f-stop is f10. I'm now putting on the ND filter and the image goes dark. To compensate, I open the f-stop to 2.8. You can now see that the buildings in the background are quite out of focus. Many people like this quite focused look because having something in focus and something else out of focus can direct the viewer's attention to exactly what you want them to see. The last filter is the polarizer. A polarizer is just like a set of Polaroid sunglasses. It'll cut the uh, glare generally. It will enhance white clouds against a blue sky by making the blue sky look darker. And it will also help you see color in water where there's a lot of reflection on it as it cuts the reflection. You can see with the polarizer on, the glare on the water is cut and the water color comes through more clearly. To learn how to tell a story with a camera, you don't need an expensive one. It's perfectly good to learn on a point and shoot camera with a video function. It'll be quite a few films before you really need to spend any more money. Video cameras come in several forms. This is a traditional video camera, has a zoom lens on the front. There's a new kind of video camera around called a DSLR. A DSLR is a high quality stills camera that also shoots video. What you're watching now was filmed on one of these. With a DSLR, you can use a variety of different lenses. When you're buying a lens, you have to ask yourself, what does it see? How well does it see it? and how much light it needs to see it. What does it see is a question about whether it's a wide lens or a long lens. Then there's a question of image quality. Will it give you a nice, clear, sharp picture? It could be the difference between looking through a sheet of glass or a plastic bag. The last thing to consider is how much light does the lens let in. This is defined by the lowest f-stop that the lens will open to. In this case it's 1.8. Other lenses might open to 2.8 or 4 or even 5.6. It's always better if the lens opens as wide as possible. So a 2.8 lens is going to give you better control in low light than a 4. And a 4 is still better than a 5.6. In this case, this 1.8 lens lets in quite a lot of light. My advice is to avoid lenses that show two different f-stops, for example, 2.8-5.6. Always go for lenses that have a single f-stop, and the lower the better. 
To find the combination that you need is a matter of your priorities. You won't be able to find a cheap zoom lens that goes all the way from wide to close that sees well in the dark and has great image quality all at the same time. Um, but you should be able to find some compromise of those two by going through the statistics and the prices and work it out. Uh, beginners shouldn't worry about equipment like this. Um, it's just not a priority. There are different methods to do a white balance on a traditional video camera or a DSLR. With this camera you tell the camera what is white by doing a white balance on a white sheet of paper. When you do the white balance in the light that you're filming in, the camera is aiming to reproduce the colours accurately. However, you can fool the camera by doing a white balance in different coloured light. If you do a white balance outside in daylight, which is bluer, and then film candlelight, the candlelight will come out warmer. In general, using a daylight white balance will make most interiors look warmer, not just candlelight. On the other hand, if you do a white balance in candlelight and then take the camera outside, the daylight outside will look very blue. As a further exercise, try white balancing on different coloured sheets of paper or different coloured objects you'll get some weird effects. With most DSLR cameras, you can dial in the colour from warm to blue. The number that you set it on depends entirely on your choice based on your needs for your film. You also have presets for white balance. Daylight, shade, cloudy, tungsten light, white fluorescent, flash, custom, Kelvin. The presets are quite exact and very good and quick. You just observe the light around you, white fluorescent light for example, or tungsten or outside in the shade, set the preset and the camera colour is set. For pinpoint accuracy, white balance shift can be used in conjunction with the other white balance controls. White balance shift and here and you move it with the toggle. You've got green, blue, magenta and red. If your scene is too red, you move the dot away from red. If your scene is too blue, you move it away from blue. You don't use lights in a film just so you can see. You use lighting to give the film a character or a mood. Three-point lighting is a means to describe how you light something. It's not a rule on how you must light. A key light is the main light falling on the subject from the front of the subject. In this example, we've got the key light falling from the left. This gives us more shape-defining shadows across the actor's face. The backlight is any light falling on the subject from behind the subject. Backlight helps separate the foreground from the background. Here you can see how the backlight gives you a hot edge, a, like a pencil line of light, across the back of the subject to separate them from the background. This is particularly useful where you have two dark colours, a dark person in the foreground and a dark background. Backlight is commonly used in conjunction with the other main light sources being key light and fill light. But you can actually do dramatically lit scenes using backlight only. This backlighting effect is most effective if the subject isn't looking directly at the camera. 
You can also light using just a backlight by bringing in a reflector and reflecting the backlight back onto the subject. The reflected light becomes a key light. Fill light is a light that falls on the front of the subject and illuminates the shadows. Here the reflector is providing the fill light. It's bouncing the light from the key onto the subject. High contrast means a large difference between the key light and the shadows. Low contrast means a small difference between the key light and the shadows. When I bring the reflector closer, the contrast is low. When I move the reflector away, the contrast increases. High contrast and low contrast are neither good nor bad. They each serve to enhance your film and you have to decide how you're going to use them. Also, with three-point lighting, remember that you'd never have to use all of the elements. You can use key or fill or key and fill or key and backlight or backlight and fill. Hard light and soft light are neither bad nor good. They're tools to use in your film. Hard light is light that comes from a single point. Hard light is light that throws very hard defined shadows. Hard light emphasizes textures and shapes. Here you can see that the hard light falling on our actor's face makes him look hard and rough and tough. Soft light, on the other hand, does not exaggerate features and textures, and it can make skin look very smooth. The hard light and the soft light that we use in this example is the same light source. It's a work light from a hardware store, and it's quite cheap. The difference is that when we make it into a soft light, we take tracing paper and place that between the light and the subject. Soft lighting doesn't mean weak lighting, it means light that is coming from a large area. What we've effectively done is turn the tracing paper into one large light and therefore light is coming from all angles. That means that there are no shadows and the light falling on the subject is very soft. Ideally, from the subject side of the light, you shouldn't be able to see through the tracing paper where the lights are. It should just be a large, smooth vision of light. When you use a light softening tracing paper, try to get the paper as close to the subject as possible and as far away from the light as possible. This will give you the softest result. Another way to get a good result is to use two layers of tracing paper with about an inch of air gap between them. The tracing paper is dressmaker's tracing paper and it can be bought cheaply from a fabric store. If you're in a situation where it's not easy to light through the tracing paper, maybe you're in a tight space, you can always try bouncing light off the wall, even if the wall's the wrong colour, because you can take the tracing paper, stick it on the wall and then bounce the light off that. Just remember that the lights are hot and so whether you're lighting through the paper or on the wall, you don't want to burn the paper and you don't want to damage the wall. Another way to look at things is to use a hard source from different angles. Moving the light around your subject is a good way to experiment and this is something you should play with extensively. Another way to light people is to silhouette them. This means lighting up the background 
and taking whatever light you can off the foreground. Then when you expose correctly for the background, they go dark. Silhouettes look best when the people are side on. People and objects in your frame will always look better against a non-distracting background. In using a plain black background or a plain white background, I'm trying to get back to my simple philosophy of always removing everything from the frame that is unnecessary and ending up with a clear, simple message. If you're filming outside and want to control the lighting, you can't control the movement of the sun across the sky, but you can usually control where the person is in relation to the sun. If you film someone outside with front sunlight falling on their face, you'll get quite strong shadows and fairly strong contrast and a quite a hard look. If you film them with the light behind them, you will usually get a softer look and lower contrast. And you'll also get the sun giving them a halo around their back. Now you can use a reflector outside which will give you bounce from the sun that's coming in from behind me. But uh, you don't always have to use a reflector. You certainly don't need to use one unless you feel it makes the shot better. When you're composing a shot, remember that you have control over the foreground and the background. Conventionally, people compose with the foreground and then the background is sort of what happens. But it's much more artistic to compose the background and fit the foreground people into the shot. Your decision might be influenced by whether the scene might benefit from a background of a hot sky or a soft green out of focus background or a long windy road. All of these things can enhance your storytelling. When you're planning your shots, it's always important to think about contrast. Contrast is the difference between dark and light areas of the frame. In this case, I'm in shadow, most of my face is in shadow with a little bit of sun, and the background is being hit by sun and it's very bright. You will often have trouble getting a correct exposure on both the shadowed foreground and the very bright background. If you expose for the background, you'll see that I go quite dark on my shadowed areas. You still see something in the sunlit areas, but the rest of me is quite dark. If you expose for the foreground, I'm correctly exposed, but the sun areas are quite light and the background that's white with sunlight on it is blazing away. Now, in certain circumstances, that might be a good thing but it's important to think about these things as you plan where you're going to shoot and what's going to be in your frame. Here I am against a similar white background, but in this case we're both in the same light and therefore we both expose for the camera pretty well. Another option you should never forget is that you could always try using a different background and get a different look. Thanks for being a part of this. It's a good idea to go over each section and experiment with the concepts and techniques one at a time. Anyway, thanks again and see you soon.